Hello and welcome to Artwork, a conversation with creative people about the joys, the challenges and the mundane moments of living an artistic life. We're your hosts, I'm Poppy Rose. And I'm Brie Robertson. And our artist today is Molly Chinna, otherwise known as the Sunshine Yogini. Molly is the one that music follows. Falling in love with live music and performance as a young girl, Molly started learning the guitar and playing live when she was just 12 years old. After spending some time working professionally in bands as a touring folk artist, Molly started to feel called to a slower pace of life and trained to be a yoga teacher. She now works full time teaching the practice of yoga in London and offering peaceful sound baths to her students using a variety of instruments, voice, vibrations and ambient sounds to enhance meditation and encourage healing from the inside out. In this episode, Molly tells us all about sound baths and the healing power sound vibrations have, especially when so many of us are living a tightly wound existence. We also talk about having trust in yourself when facing decisions in your creative life and how it's important to have an holistic approach as an artist to protect ourselves from physical or emotional burnout. Let's dive in. nice to have you here on the podcast we can't wait to chat to you today all about your journey with music and sound and sound healing and I've been lucky enough to attend some of your sound baths um, virtually on zoom and I'm really excited to just like find out more about how you got into it and you know more of the, the benefits and like the all the goodness that can come from sound uh, so yes welcome Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) A pleasure. So you started off doing folk music, quite similar to me and Brie. Um, And and, yeah, I feel like we've had kind of similar journeys in that sense, um, doing lots of touring and um, being really active in the folk music world. So yeah, tell us a little bit about that, how you started and what some of the fun things you got up to on your on your journey. Pre-COVID. Oh, oh I mean, yeah, still pre-COVID. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that mysterious time before COVID. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I started, I think I picked up a guitar for the first time when I was about 11. And my idols at the time were Billy Joe Armstrong and Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton. And um, my dad is also a musician. And so I've kind of grown with his music taste um and I was desperate to be like a heavy punk rocker and you know uh, all through my teen years I was in punk bands and had loads of fun shredding guitar oh fun (laughs) Um, I didn't know this that's so cool well so well yeah you wouldn't be able to tell now which is kind of sad maybe (laughs) a little bit different now but (laughs) yeah I'm feeling like maybe post-covid I should reignite the um the punk but yeah oh my god yes (laughs) <laughs> punk sound healing <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that's a thing um so yeah when I was probably about 18 I, I had sort of maybe toned things down a, a little bit and was doing more duo work with a friend of mine from school um and we played together as a folk duo for a while and did lots of recording and um then we both went to university and kind of took our own paths but my journey into kind of folk as a solo artist really begun after I'd finished university and um, I went to California for a little while to do some traveling back when we could do anything we wanted (laughs) and go anywhere in the world Um, and yeah I just fell in love with the kind of bohemian beautifulness that California is and that really inspired my songwriting Um, yeah so I spent a few years kind of writing and figuring out my sound and having fun and um yeah then I kind of got initiated into the band that I'm in now um who sadly I haven't seen in a very long time but um we're called Molly in the Moon and we're just kind of like a mishmash of people who all love music and do random things (laughs) cold is the night without you here I know the sunshine is yours my dear And I miss 
miss your heart and the warmth of your love. You are my mind tonight. And I've known heartache before. So music has really been like something that's been constant in your whole life. Um, and I'm really interested because you're not, are, are you with Molly and the Moon, are you still, what type of music are you making? Is it still that folky music or is it something completely different? So the band Molly and the Moon, we make sort of bluegrass folk. It's very vocal um, harmony inspired and harmony driven kind of bluegrass folk um which is in one corner and then I'm in an assortment of kind of other groups uh where we I do lots of different projects one of which is kind of like a disco electronic funk mix um so I've got my hands in a few pies and I would say I'm a little bit of a um a genre fluid musician (laughs) at the moment um yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, because I find, <laughs> I don't know, for me personally, I was definitely like in this like folk singer songwriter zone in this bubble, if you will. And uh, yeah, I think it's so amazing that you can have all these different uh, interests of, of music and diff- different projects going on and that you're excited mm. by by all of them. That's really, really cool. So tell Aww. us a little bit about the the other other bands and projects that you're you're a part of. Yeah, so um, I definitely have felt over my life as a musician that I haven't really fitted into one place. When I was a teenager, I was into punk and heavy rock and grunge. Uh, and I still kind of really like that music in a way. I don't really listen to it as much anymore, but um, I'm also really into world music. Um, and, and folk is kind of the, the sound that really drives underneath everything I think I'm, I'm deeply enchanted by storytelling um, mm. and so artists like Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell just kind of really speak to something very deeply within me that most other genres can't kind of hit that heartbreaking beautifulness <laughs> that is yeah. that kind of storytelling that you find in folk um, so I'm also in a, a group called Little Paradise and we're on a maybe a little bit of a break I guess at the moment during COVID I'm hoping we can get back into the studio soon but we make um kind of a disco funk fusion I'm not really sure what to call it it's very electronic based um and that actually has really informed my journey into producing my own uh music which um is electronic so I use a lot of pads and drones but I make meditation music and sound healing um, rather than the kind of disco funk vibe on my own um, so yeah a little bit of a mishmash going on but I really enjoy mm. exploring genres and kind of having fun and yeah I'm a bit of a bursting musician I can't quite keep it all in <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah that's, really, that's really beautiful it's really beautiful that you're just so like open to be out to creating yeah what Poppy said before being open to creating in different genres and um, letting yourself kind of experience creating music that sounds completely different. I think it's so common that especially musicians get quite locked into Mm. one project that they're really trying to make work and make a success and they don't really have the capacity or the energy or the, the ability to branch out and explore other things for fun. I so agree That's with that. Yeah, yeah, cool. definitely. It's it's interesting to be able to kind of explore other genres. And um, I don't use music to support my um, career so much anymore, although the sound healing obviously comes into that. But I'm not a professional touring artist anymore. And so I feel that I can have the capacity to explore without having to worry about releasing or writing albums that um, Mm -hmm. hit a certain market which is a a really lovely freedom it has its pros and cons obviously but um, yeah I really enjoy that freedom creative kind of path. Yeah so you wanted to have like a slower pace of life and 
a, this is kind of going to link us into the the sound healing I think um when you like train to become a yoga teacher so how did you find yoga and this uh more slow calm way of life yeah I think um it's a really organic transition and, and the older I get and the more I work within the well-being industry the more I can kind of see this transition that I've made from a distance and see how organic it was I, I've really sort of mm. in the past kind of divided my life and been like that was my life as a musician and now this is my life as a yoga teacher um but I was so burnt out as a musician which I know mm. um you've maybe both experienced before it just is something that is so yeah. well accepted kind of as a artist it's like oh yeah burnout that's just gonna happen um mm. and you know I just I got so burnt out and yoga was really what I was falling back on to kind of replenish what tiny reserves I had left um yeah. and eventually I was like you know I'm just gonna I'm just gonna not do music for a while just do some just do yoga I'd totally fallen in love with the way it made me feel um and so I trained quite soon after I kind of made that decision to step away from being a professional musician, at least for a while. Um, and it's only really now that I'm finding my way back into music, but from a much different angle. It's kind of been informed by my journey into teaching yoga. And now I'm kind of being presented with all these beautiful ancient arts of sound healing that are just kind of unraveling in front of me. And I'm like, wow, there's so much here. <laughs> this is awesome amazing oh, yeah really oh, enjoying that I'm really interested in knowing how it was for you to kind of make that decision of I'm not gonna do music for a while did you did you kind of know that maybe you wouldn't go back to it in the way that you had before or was that kind of a bit too daunting to decide in that moment and it kind of gradually happened that you were able to let go of probably something that you were working quite hard for before and in your life what was the process of having to kind of let go of something that you were working towards that's a really great question and I think um it definitely at the time I felt not ready to let go of that completely and wasn't aware really that I was letting go of it in the way that I was it was definitely a good thing that I did um because gigging every night and you know the kind of life being up really late and going to sound checks at whatever time of night and touring all around the UK um it really does take its toll on your physical and mental well-being and at the time mm. I was just thinking mm. oh you know I'll take some time out and I'll do something else and when I come back I'll have this passion reignited I really felt like I'd lost a lot of creative juice just having to kind of yeah. churn out songs at a, a pace that um I'm just no good at really. <laughs> yeah, um, I resonate a lot of so much. Yeah, <laughs> so much pressure. Yeah, and I I really feel that some people maybe are geared to doing that. Um, my songs have never really been that commercial, and so I felt that I was having to kind of churn them out and make art at a pace that I wasn't comfortable with, and I wasn't comfortable with the quality that it was coming out at. I felt that mm. I wasn't really getting across what I was trying to say, so I was like, you know what. I'll, take some time out um didn't at the time think that that was kind of the end of that era um but now looking back it definitely was the end of that era but in a yeah I think in a really positive way that um I chose to kind of take um my mental health into account as opposed to just kind of driving myself continuously into the ground mm, in order to yeah. chase something that might not ever have happened really um yeah 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 Oh, yeah. I resonate with that so, so mm. much. I think that's a really, you've had a really similar journey to to me in that sense of mm -hmm. working super hard and being super passionate about your music. And then for me, I I didn't really recognize that I needed to take a break. Um, and because I didn't really know that it was possible because I was relying on it solely for my income. Um, but then for me, when COVID hit, which was over a year ago now, and I couldn't do anything, and uh, I couldn't do concerts. I was kind of forced to to stop and like re 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 um, like reconsider everything and mm. take a look at my life and really think about what what I was enjoying and what my mental health state was in. And um, 
yeah so for you was that a, a conscious decision that you recognized that you were doing too much or was this around the similar time of covid no it was definitely before for me i think it was around mm. 2000 and mm, probably around 2019 maybe mm-hmm. actually before that 2018 that i chose to kind of wind things in a little bit um Mm. and that's when I sort of learned to teach yoga it took me about a month to train uh, I was working luckily in a cafe so music wasn't my sole income um, which was really lucky because the artist's journey is kind of this balance between oh I need to make mm. art and I for my heart yeah. but I need to make money for my mm. living <laughs> yeah um, and absolutely. so you know I had I could carry on working in the cafe for a bit while I was kind of working things out. And um, I did then continue playing music, but it was definitely a, a more conscious choice. Every gig that I chose, I wanted to do. Uh, and mm. uh, I met Poppy at the Om um, Yoga show or, or was it the, oh, it was Yogific in Bristol. And, yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. And, you know, that was a, I was kind of making this conscious choice to try and get my music out to a different kind of place and and the gigs that I was Mm. doing quite a few of them were for free because I was thinking oh well you know I want to spread my I want to spread my message and I want to play music for fun um Mm. obviously I wasn't I wasn't having to rely on making money from music which I think is a conversation a lot of people are afraid to have um is the kind of money conversation around art and Mm. um and whether or not it can be um stable Uh, as an income and I think for me I was like you know what I'm just going to play music for fun and hopefully I'll still be able to find the love in it and that for me really worked and I did find this reconnection to music I found it very healing for myself Um, and then uh, and then that kind of led into this wacky journey that I'm on at the moment (laughs) it's my sound healing What do you think about this capitalistic way that we are working as artists right now? And is that kind of what you experienced of like you are in this capitalistic society and yet you want to be an artist? Do you think the two work can work well together or do you think that this like way of churning out art to feed the machine is just not conducive to, you know, true like (laughs) creativity and being authentic as an artist and feeling, um, you know, satisfied. I'm really interested to just hear what you think about that. Yeah, it's a really, really brilliant question. I have this conversation with um, peers so much. I'm in writing groups and um, I think something that I see a lot, uh, I don't actually feel like I have an answer, a straight up answer to that question, but something that I see. (laughs) It's a big question. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Something I I see a lot of the time is um, the more sort of connected an artist is with their with their art, I think the less feasible it seems to be commercially. And that's not across the board. I think there might be some exceptions. Um, Laura Marling is a fantastic artist and is deep. Mm. I feel deeply connected Mm. to her work, but is making Mm. it work. I haven't had a personal conversation with her, so maybe (laughs) she would say something different. But um, uh, I I don't know. I feel the people that I've seen make it commercially see their art as a way of income, as a job. And they've kind of um, been able to play the game a bit and have distanced Mm. themselves from that art and can be like, okay, well, I need to familiarise myself with x y and z and build these skills in order to make this commercially viable and um i think within the heart art is such a soul driven thing that's how i feel about it anyway Mm -hmm. that the capitalist kind of fire just kind of burns through that um true authentic art when it when it really takes hold um so I don't know. I think there. this has always been the artist's struggle and there's definitely a balance to be struck. And I think, you know, you can make a living out of your art and it, it can be fulfilling, um, but it's just kind of taking care of yourself and making sure that you still feel fulfilled and potentially having like a little side hustle just to keep things ticking over, um, just yeah. in case. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
And I don't think there's any shame in having a side hustle. I think a lot of artists feel like they have to get to the point where um, their art is what's sustaining them. But Mm. if you need to, you know, if you need to work to fund your art, that's great that you that you are giving yourself the the capability to do what you love even if that's not sustaining you solely in the moment I don't think there's any shame um for artists to have to do that and it's it's strange that I think so many people do feel mm-hmm. that they have I mean, to I've sure to for, I've for sure felt like that and when I kind of stepped back from music last year like and realized that I you know would need to do something different i felt so much shame and like I was letting people down and like I was a failure because I was Mm. giving up and all of this uh stuff that was just completely in my own head and um I wasn't letting anyone down by doing what I needed to do and take a step back and look after myself and if anything if I'd carried on inauthentically I would have been letting people down even more um but yeah there is a huge I, I felt definitely a huge weight of all of this shame and guilt um for wanting to try something different and not solely rely on my music for income I really I think for me because that getting all my money from music was my goal and that was the end goal for me was to live from my music um Mm. so to let go of that really yeah made that's I think that's what made me feel like a a failure in in that moment but like you say Brie it is there is no shame in Mm. letting go and pivoting changing direction or you know changing Absolutely. completely changing direction um I think that that's something that we need to to share more definitely yeah. hello hello it's your artwork podcast host briefly interrupting this episode we hope you're enjoying this conversation and feeling really inspired by this story We'd just like to remind you that the Artwork Podcast is a completely independent project and we'd really appreciate your help in spreading the word. You can do that by subscribing, leaving a comment or a review and sharing the podcast with your friends on your social media and tagging us in your stories at art.workconversation. You can also support the podcast through our tip jar on Patreon. If you believe in this project and you feel there's value in sharing these stories, a small contribution will help us keep going. You can choose to give a monthly or a single donation, and there are some special little rewards in there for you too. And we invite you to continue the artwork conversation by joining our Artwork Community Facebook group. There, you will be able to connect with the artist we have featured on the podcast and share your art with like-minded creatives. We can't wait to see you there. Let's get back to the conversation. So where are you now? (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, well, I was working... I think this is where it started from. When I was working at the cafe and I was touring and kind of gigging as much as possible whilst working at a cafe, then uh, um, funnily enough, opposite the cafe, there was a, um, I I guess he's a shaman um, working from the, there's a treatment room sort of opposite the cafe in this little village that I worked in. And um, he would bring his gongs and his, bowls and his all of the instruments that he'd accumulated and he would offer people sound healing from from the treatment room opposite so I I could hear the gongs while I was making coffee and I was just like wow that just sounds like otherworldly I've never heard anything like it um and I'd sort of sneak in on my breaks and he'd give me little mini treatments Uh, I'd sometimes take my dog and she'd fall asleep which was divine you know yeah, it really shows the effect of these beautiful instruments on the animals. They really feel it, um, really calms them down. So, yeah, he he was kind of this, I don't know, this kind of spark that ignited in my mind. And I was really interested in everything that he did, obviously, as a musician, anything that makes a sound. I'm like a magpie. I'm like, oh, mm. what's that? I want to dong that. I want to ding that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so when I left the village and um, came uh, to London, he gave me two Tibetan singing bowls and they're these little tiny bowls. And I would use them in my yoga classes at the end just to kind of chime them and give people a little mini dose of sound and vibration. And 
it kind of led on from there. I had my own studio for a while in uh, the Cotswolds and I had a didgeridoo that I just kind of had lying around the studio, which I can't play. Um, and our sound healer would come in and eventually I kind of traded my didgeridoo for one of his gongs. And so I started accumulating all these instruments. I've now got a ridiculous amount of instruments and I would consider myself a hoarder, need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just kind of been this unraveling of blissful music and I'm just fascinated by anything that makes a sound and um yeah so I collect sacred instruments now and this kind of me just donging the sound bowl at the end of my yoga classes has grown into me sort of being like actually I, I want to I want to give people sound baths sort of instead of just teaching yoga um I teach yoga as well um but sound is kind of blended into what I offer as a wellness practitioner um, and I, I find so much satisfaction in, in offering people that beautiful moment of healing I think everyone experiences sound so differently um, mm. we can talk a little bit more about exactly what happens <laughs> while you get a gong bath but um, it's just yeah it's just so magical just hearing people's experiences afterwards and kind of working with people to give them these beautiful kind of moments of transcendence and meditation um so that's kind of where I'm at now wow mm. that's amazing I, absolutely like because I, I said I have uh, attended a couple of your sound baths uh on zoom and it is like magical is definitely the world the word that um springs to mind uh during and after as well I remember the first one um I, f I fell asleep afterwards and I woke up and the next day every single cell of my body felt so relaxed and rested and uh like recharged in a way that my f I, my, I could feel all of my limbs like really heavily but in a way that I hadn't felt them before because my whole body f had actually relaxed for the first time in a really long time um so it, I know that I've experienced the magical power of a sound bath but um, for our listeners who don't know, explain to us what is a sound bath? What does it entail? And also, what does it do? How How is the sound making its magic? Mm. It's, a, it's from what I know already, which is probably nothing <laughs> currently. And the more yeah. I read, the more I'm like, wow, there's so much to learn. And it's fascinating. Um, so... It's, a, it's an incredibly ancient form of therapy um, and sound is the therapist. And so I very much just consider myself kind of the facilitator of that sound. The sound is the healer. So if you came to a sound bath, you might experience um, all sorts of different instruments, but it's, a f it's mostly seen as a form of meditation. And so you'll most likely lie or sit down and you'll be guided through 60 to 90 minutes of just the most, some of the most beautiful sounds you may have ever heard. I certainly felt that way when I first went to a sound bath. I was like, oh my God, I just want to sit up and listen because this is just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to watch the woman working on the gongs, but um, uh, yeah, so it, it's a form of meditation and it guides you so deeply into yourself um our entire world everything that we are our universe is woven together with vibration we're all made of vibration everything our cells are vibrating everything that you see everything you touch is made of vibration and so sound healing is a technique that kind of works on that principle and uses vibration to stimulate healing patterns within the body um, it very much works on the energy body. So the, the system of the chakras, if you're not familiar, the sort of energy system that works within us. Um, and it kind of uses a kind of building of vibration, different tones, different notes, different scales, some of which might be a bit ethereal and a bit otherworldly. It just washes everything away. It's this sort of deep, subtle cleaning 
of mm. any excess energy in any way. So over energizing or under energizing or can all lead to different kind of feelings of imbalance. And sound bath really just works to kind of reharmonize and tune up the body and the mind so that you leave feeling rebalanced. So the vibrations is is sound affecting us everywhere we go without us even realizing? Uh, yes, absolutely. So sound pollution is such an issue um, in the modern day and we're so sensitive to sound. I think, you know, if you watch a dog listen to something really high pitched, a dog has better hearing than us, sure, but you can kind of see the vibration affect them. Like even if we can't hear something, that vibration still affects us on a certain level. And so we're kind of in the middle of this um, onslaught of sound pollution. And that's why it's a little unsettling sometimes if you go way out into nowhere and it is just silent. Uh, mm. and we might feel a little unsettled because our energy rhythms and our vibrations are kind of moving at this really fast pace because we're used to having our vibration disturbed constantly all the time. Um, and so when we experience silence for the first time, it, ca it can feel a bit unsettling as our body isn't sure how to vibrate. Um, it's, yeah, I think the more we look into sound and the more we understand how sound can really help to reharmonize the body and soothe our spirit and release worry, fear and anger um, and enhance joy and happiness and kind of balance we can really understand how we fit within the universe each of us vibrates slightly differently and something I've come to learn is everyone within everyone in a sound bath so if I if I had 30 people in the room everyone would experience that differently and mm. some people come up to me afterwards and will say like oh wow the crystal bowls they just sort of really sang to me it sounded like angels or some people might be like oh god I wasn't sure about the gongs they kind of disturbed me but mm. each of these vibrations are totally sacred and are reharmonizing something retuning something and that might not feel comfortable and so I think sound bath and sound healing has definitely got a reputation for being always like really mellow and really beautiful and and it is that and you more than likely will just experience that beauty but occasionally it might be that you feel disturbed or that you feel a little uncomfortable as as your body really tries to work through something that might be lodged in the energetic system that the kind of crystal bowls or the gong or the chimes are kind of reharmonizing and so it can be really deeply healing and very moving and often ex extremely emotional um, mm. as you let go of anything that's kind of lodged up in there <laughs> Have you, have you had any specific moments where you felt like, oh, wow, something just shifted there in me? Or have you heard of people that maybe you've given sound baths to where the sound has really clearly like affected them in some way or he, like specifically healed them in a way that's like quite tangible to see? Mm, I think um, I've had a, a few experiences myself, which I'll go into in a moment. But something that seems to be very common with people attending maybe like a monthly sound bath and um, not incorporating sound that much in, but sort of coming on a monthly basis, is that it really affects the physical body. I get a lot of people that come that have ailments like lower back pain or 
discomfort, like a mild level of inflammation, perhaps somewhere in the body. And it's something that often happens is they'll feel very, very hot during the sound bath in that specific area. And then we'll say after that that pain has in fact gone uh, and it might maybe slowly creep back in over the month if the lifestyle isn't changed. Say you have lower back pain mm. from a sedentary lifestyle, you might go to sound bath and it will really, really help to heal that lower back pain. But then, you know, you go back to being sedentary, it might creep back in. But, yeah, you know, sound bath can be a really fantastic medicine in helping to kind of support a well-being practice. Um, the more you get, the more you're going to see the benefits. Um, but for me, I've had some really sort of transformative moments of release. I think when I first experienced the gongs for the first time, I was quite like, wow, I've never heard anything like this. This is quite strange. I was a bit yeah. like, oh. Um, and I afterwards had this huge moment of release. I was crying and really felt um emotional not not particularly sad but this kind of deep heart-based release like really letting go and I, I was a little bit scared because I didn't really know what was going on and, and no one really told me to expect that but I came to understand afterwards that it was just my energy body kind of releasing something that was lodged in there I felt yeah. so much lighter and so much freer afterwards that yeah it, it can be so transformative and so mm. powerful Wow. It's amazing how much our body holds on to um, that we just don't even know about. You know, like I, I've never even considered is my body affected by the noise that I'm hearing constantly outside my window in Berlin. Um, I have noticed lately that if there's like a loud noise, I'm really affected by it. Like it really mm. makes me kind of want to... <laughs> I don't know, like it triggers me into some kind mm. of anxiety um, attack or something. But, um, mm. yeah, it's just amazing to kind of, and especially after the year we've had, I can only imagine the different like um, mm. stresses that people are, have got kind of somehow trapped in their mm. body, in their in their energy and um we just don't even know it's there until, until we go and experience something vibrational like a sound bath and it releases. It's amazing. It's, yeah, that's so, so true. There's a fantastic book um, called The Body Keeps the Score um, and it kind of talks about um, held trauma and how the body will always remember a traumatic pattern or, it, you know, the way that you held yourself during a phase of trauma or during something unpleasant that that happened and it, all it can take is kind of you repositioning yourself into that shape or holding your body in that way or breathing in a specific way to kind of reignite that trauma and so using these ancient healing practices to kind of rid the body of those imbalances and and really dig into those places that might hold on to trauma it can be so healing without us even really realizing that we are holding those traumas um, mm. And as you said, that you were, you know, listening outside your window in Berlin, I think that we have kind of grown accustomed to this much higher sort of noise level. Um, and I feel that when we're, we're kind of living in the sympathetic nervous system, which is our nervous system that is designed to um, fight or flight, uh, as we all kind of know, that's the stress response. Mm. And the louder the noise around you, the more your body will be holding itself in that kind of fight, flight or freeze mode, ready to ready to fight, flight or freeze because it feels that it's in danger. And so mm. um, we kind of build ourselves into these like really tightly wound kind of creatures or beings. And something like sound bath can be so unraveling that when we first experience it, we don't even know how tightly coiled we are. Um, and it can mm. be really, really moving. It can be so beautiful as well. Wow. I think I need yeah. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel so tightly wound up right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh I my really gosh. feel I really feel that like you say about the always being in a flight, fight or freeze mm -hmm. situation. And I think I mean, I certainly, when I go out for my walks and I know I'm going to be walking along a busy road um, before I get into the 
hills and woods or whatever um I just take my noise cancelling headphones maybe I don't listen Mm -hmm. to any sound through them or any music but I just turn the noise cancelling switch on so I don't have to hear the cars because I just find cars so loud at the moment Mm -hmm. and it's all just Mm -hmm. just being outside uh you know in in a city life I find just so overwhelming um at the moment and I much prefer when I get out into the to the hills and I can just hear the birds and and the little insects flying around and I feel Mm. so much more at peace with that and um yeah I'm definitely in need of a another sand bath soon (laughs) Molly I'm really interested in knowing how you've kind of learned how to how to um practice the the sound healing because mm. um, you've mentioned that it's like an ancient an ancient healing form an ancient art form and how have you kind of learned that have you had to kind of dig deep into the roots of where this came from to kind of fully understand it or like who has taught you I just I'm really mm. fascinated I'd love to hear kind of how you've learned about all of this oh it's such an ongoing process for me and um I feel that I haven't got a lot more to learn I'd love to become qualified as a kind of music therapist which is a a whole another thing in itself but my initial education into sound healing in in these principles that we talk about was um from the chap that had his practice opposite the cafe where I worked so his name is Aidan McIntyre um and he is one of the sort of a gong master elders in the UK I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying (laughs) Um, (laughs) he's extremely experienced and um, I used to go and help him at his house kind of uh, he would offer a lot of trainings in Cotswolds and so I'd help him kind of shift his gongs around and I'd do some collaborations with him and and during that process he would teach me about the gongs um, where they came from how to play them there's all these amazing kind of magical ways you can play them to make them really sing it's it's the gong itself that sings mm. and you don't really have to do that much I find to make it just the sound soar um but he was kind of my initial educator and I, I really owe him so much um but I've gone on to I've done all of my own reading which I just feel is endless and and I'd love to read more and there's so much to kind of dive into but another one of my educators is a a wonderful woman called Anne Malone who is a fantastic sound healer she works from London and when I first saw Anne I was like this woman is who I want to be (laughs) she's kind of got a similar uh, history to me and, and I found that so inspiring. I felt this kind of kinship with her. She's come from a bit more of a rock and roll background as she was a touring artist um, back in the 80s, I think, and um, has worked with some of the biggest bands on tour. And um, I watched her play. I've watched one of her sound baths and she uses her voice, which is something that I didn't know I could do I didn't even really think about it I was like you know no one wants to hear me sing I can only sing folk music (laughs) and um I watched her use her voice and use mantras these like sacred ancient sounds and just sing with no inhibitions and no kind of you know she sat she's Irish she she was singing a couple of old Irish folk songs and I was just like wow this woman's a powerhouse um Mm. so she's been a a really big influence in my education as well and I think I'm going to enroll on her training in September which um I think will give me a whole lot more insight into what she does because she just seems to have it nailed (laughs) yeah wow wow. I can imagine there must just be so much to it that like yeah yeah, that you'd want to you'd want to just I don't know, fill yourself with so that you could really understand like the power of what you're doing and Mm -hmm. and having an understanding of what's happening as you're playing those gongs. It must just be a real honour to Mm -hmm. be able to be a part of that and and use those ancient instruments. And It's so heartwarming and I think something I would say to anyone who's listening who is interested in 
these conversations and in sound as a healing art is the thing that I've been told from both of the mentors I've had is, you know, if you have got a sort of musicality in you, just start with that, share that, and Mm. the rest sort of like shares itself. I think if you have a basic understanding of music, most of my singing bowls, uh, the the crystal singing bowls especially, are, are in major keys and tones and and if you have a basic understanding of scales you can tone them so that they sing together and they harmonize um Mm. and just share what you love share what you know it is very much something that comes from the inside and you can spend thousands and thousands and thousands on very expensive trainings and kind of you know there's always more to learn of course but I really do feel that music and sound it comes from it comes from the inside and if you want to share don't be afraid to do that before this um pivot that you made um to now and and the way that you view your journey now what are the differences Mm. Yes, I think, yeah, it definitely is going to be a much different landscape when the restrictions are lifted. And I think prior to coronavirus, I was actually living at home. Now I live in London and I work in London sort of sharing yoga and music. And I think I'm I'm just interested to see kind of what unfolds. I'm definitely mm. still going to be probably you know, putting my guitar on my back and hiking around London and trying to do a few of the open mics <laughs> just for a bit of fun. But yeah, um, nice. for the majority of my music, I think it will mostly be in this sort of like ambient meditation music and sound healing. And that's what I feel is really coming out of the inside of me at the moment. Um, yeah. I do still pick up my guitar. And I do still write folk songs and I do still love to share that. So I'm hoping that I can upkeep that kind of part of me as well. Um, But yeah, I think I'm I'm interested to see what happens. I'm very open. Mm. Yeah, I I think it's really, really nice to, it feels like this part of the journey seems much less stressful and um, yeah. more intuitive, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, Mm. it it feels like, you know, that there's a much more holistic understanding of like what the journey is, whereas Mm. before and and probably what all three of us have experienced is that you just, you have this one destination and you go, 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 and you don't think about the rest of your, you know, your whole self, your, your mind, your emotional capacity, your physical body, um, and do you think that you've been able to kind of pursue something creative and and maybe like jump out of that capitalistic way of mm. thinking and way of producing? I do. I do. I feel that this space and time has given me the space and time <laughs> to <laughs> kind of reflect <laughs> on nice what it is that I actually authentically feel that I want to share. And Mm. it's definitely given me the capacity to tune in to myself. Sorry for the pun. And (laughs) I didn't even (laughs) realise. I was just thinking about how nice time and space would be. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Oh, it's just, yeah, I think it's been really nice to not have the pressure to Mm. make music before coronavirus and probably a little bit before that as well I was definitely in a place where I was feeling the pressure to just produce music yeah. um and now I make music when I want to make it and and I am releasing some music at the end of this month on the 30th of April um exciting but it just kind of comes out of me when it wants to now which yeah. is a little bit mm. um uh, unsettling because I just don't know when it's going to happen but <laughs> It's a little bit nicer, I think. I just feel I don't have as much pressure on me, which um, allows the creative juices to flow a little bit more. Mm. And speaking of creative juices, uh, you've released, like as well as your folk music, you've released a couple of like ambient sound healing tracks um, on Spotify and, and everywhere. Um, 
so yeah I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those because I know you you do use your voice uh in some of those tracks I have them on a regular rotation Mm -hmm. um so yeah how did that those tracks come about and uh yeah just how do how do they come about how do you feel about sharing them and uh, all of those things oh yeah that is very I'm learning um I'm not a natural producer. I would say I didn't have the education in music production when I was younger, which I feel um, maybe put me behind slightly, but I've learned lots from some of the people I've worked with and I try and pay attention as much as possible when I'm in the studio so I can kind of figure out logic and YouTube's been great as well. Um, yeah. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I so mostly cool. use pads and drones and um, to build this kind of, I love building ambient soundscapes that can just transport Mm. the listener somewhere where, wherever they feel their happy places. And, um, and uh, over the top of those um, ambient sort of soundscapes, I like to layer in crystal bowls because they just sound so beautiful when they've Mm. been recorded, which um, I'm still working out how to record a gong and for it not to, (laughs) distort horribly yeah, in the microphone yeah. because they're, they're pretty powerful so um, I'm still working on that one but um, yeah I, I like to layer in crystal bowls and chimes and I use my voice and I'm kind of experimenting with what can make beautiful sounds I've just bought a kalimba which I'm in love with it's the most perfect little instrument and it just sounds beautiful um, so yeah I just really enjoy making music that people can relax to I teach a lot of yoga and so at the end of my class I love putting on a song that will just you know the whole class just kind of exhales and they just can lie on the floor for a bit and just mm. relax I, I really love that uh, allowing people to have that space because I just feel people don't do that by themselves that much so if I've got you no. in a class I'm like right you're good you know you're gonna lie still for a bit <laughs> yes yes please please tell me to lie still <laughs> I'll only do it if somebody else tells me to do yes. it. <laughs> no, I'm I'm the same. You know, I come from that kind of, um, yeah, that kind of place as well. So, um, yeah, so I love to create that ambience for people to relax into. Um, so I think it's so amazing out. that you did. Oh, sorry. Carry on. No, 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 no. Oh, I was just going to say I've got a track coming out. Um, I think it's April 30th, which is kind of al- along that ilk it's crystal Mm -hmm. bowls and Mm -hmm. chimes and that sort of thing so if you want something to relax to then keep your eye out for that one (laughs) amazing and uh, your artist name on all of that is uh the sunshine yogini so we will Mm. link all of that below as well but i think it's so cool that you did all the production or you do all the production for those tracks yourself and that you've just kind of picked it up as you've gone along your musical journey and learnt uh and taught yourself along the way uh, I just think that's so inspiring, especially mm. as a woman, because mm. I know that the production world and to call yourself a producer as a female is, is it's, it just it seems it's a very male dominated space. Uh, and I think I've been listening to a couple of other uh, podcasts recently about like music and um, songwriting as, as a woman. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's so cool that you're just, you found the courage to to just do that and because I think so many so many women don't because it is such a male-dominated world uh you know the production side of things and we need more more women as as everywhere (laughs) every industry every part of Mm. every creative everything needs more women um so yeah I just want to tip my hat to you for for doing that uh yourself I think it's really really cool Mm. Oh, that's very sweet. I totally agree with you. We do need way more women. So, um, yeah, in everything. And I think it's so easy as a female artist to be overlooked um, as someone who works on the technical side, because Mm. I've, I've found personally, if I turn up to a show with my band, the first person the sound engineer will talk to is one of the other members of my band um Mm -hmm. about the sound which is frustrating because I'm like you know I'm the person that's singing so I you know I I want them to talk to me so I think you know you you almost have to take it upon yourself a little bit it's very easy to be overlooked and to to not receive that education because I don't we people assume that women don't have that place 
um, within the music world that we're just supposed to be at the front and that's mm. it um, or to be the creative one and that's it and so it is difficult to to be able to be heard in that space but um, I'm quite tenacious <laughs> good for you girl <laughs> I'm determined yes. to learn <laughs> yeah Amazing. that is awesome super inspiring I'm also I, on just on top of what Poppy said just so amazed that you were able to kind of let something go and I I think you're such an amazing example of when something doesn't feel right and and you want to take a different way in life um the other path will will meet you there and Mm. you know it's not as if you gave music up and then you were destitute and alone forever Mm. it's like Mm you gave something up and then you had the space to do something else. And I think that's just so encouraging Mm. to hear because I think we can so often think, oh, my gosh, if I let go of this dream, I've got nothing left or Mm. I'll I'll have I'll have nothing to do with my life or I don't know what I will do. But we have to trust that if we do let something go, something else will come along for us to grab a hold of. And, um, Mm. yeah, just well done you for being able to know what you – what was right for you oh thank you so much it is it can be so overwhelming I think and especially if you're relying on that income it can be like oh gosh sort of slipping into the into nothingness but um someone said something to me the other day and I thought it was such a beautiful phrase and I feel like it works really well here as well in that sometimes surrendering and letting go can feel like just jumping off of a cliff without a parachute but if you really do surrender and trust then the universe will catch you with a bet with a bed of feathers um and Mm. I I feel like that's happened time and time again um in my life and and I would encourage anyone else who's considering if something isn't right for them or you know if you need to let something go is to just maybe focus on trust because the universe will always catch you in one way or another it may not be initially clear but it is there it will be there Hmm. so our last question is uh do you have any words of wisdom that you've lived by or that have helped you um that you want to share with our our listeners um if for anything to do with anything that we've talked about today with choosing the right path and or sound healing any nuggets of of wisdom that that you want to share it sounds so cheesy and this is going to sound like a Disney movie, which, yeah, we is its it. own thing. But <laughs> I love Disney. <laughs> Give um, us the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do feel like if you if you really do just trust yourself in what your capabilities are, whatever they are, even if it feels that that's not going to support you, mm. just trust that and really put yourself in into that as I've been a person over my life in some ways uh, you know I've burnt out I've probably spread myself too thin and not applied myself to one thing because I'm Mm -hmm. afraid that it won't work but if you do if you do trust in yourself it will happen it might take a bit of time but it will happen (laughs) well thank you so much Molly for coming and talking to us and sharing your story with us today it's just I feel I feel really peaceful having just heard about the sound healing, to be honest. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm awesome. just imagining it thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, that would be so relaxing. <laughs> mm, I'll give you a sound healing online sometime soon. Oh, I would and, love that. Yes, come and have I'm going gonna to follow you. And when you do an online sound bath next, I think I'll be joining. Yeah, I, think I need awesome. it. <laughs> I would recommend. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. We'd really appreciate it if you would take the time to subscribe to our podcast and review the episode so that more people can find us in the future. Your comments help us pop up on people's suggested podcasts, helping our artist stories reach a wider audience. Podcasts are best shared by word of mouth. So if you know people who might enjoy this episode or the artwork podcast as a whole, we would love it if you told them all about it or tagged us in your social media posts and stories. 
And if you'd like to financially support this project, you can contribute on Patreon, where you can choose the amount you'd like to give us for lots of fun rewards. And if you'd like to be a part of the Artwork Conversation, we would love to invite you to join our Artwork Community Facebook group, where you can connect with the artists we've featured on the podcast and share your art with a like-minded community. You can find the link in the show notes as well as all the links to today's artist. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at art.workconversation. And stay tuned for our next inspiring episode. Bye. Bye.